estamos buscando para la verdad del vaquero. ¿Qué es la verdad? Mira, la verdad del vaquero es muy sencillo. Buscar, encuentra el vaquero. What does it mean to be a cowboy? Oh man, it's my life. I get to see things that people never get to see. We went on down to Coahuila, Mexico. We sort of they got the horses up early. It was dark. And I got on horseback. We went all day long and got back at night. And uh, but we rounded up some cows and, and got them to the pens and marked them. But that was in Mexico, in Coahuila. Sure was. A lot of fun. Por ejemplo, el otoño íbamos a buscar a la hacienda en la montaña. Entonces nos íbamos por 10 días, por ejemplo, ¿no? con los gauchos y dormíamos ahí en la montaña este, con el caballo atado y dormíamos afuera. Well, the fun time was getting them in a crowd and roping. I, I used to pride myself on, on roping. And, and I did good and I did bad, you know. But uh, I enjoyed it, you know, and that, that, that's, that's the truth. 25,000 acres, 60 head of horses and 20 cowboys and a trailer full of dogs. Sometimes I wished I was born 100 years ago so I could have been a real cowboy. It was a long time ago, and there was nothing out here but just plain old flat country except for one, one spring right down here. We got on spring ranch. I'm Gaston Davis. It was these types of stories that sparked my fascination with cowboys. For six generations, the ranch has been in my family. From the sheep queen of Texas to the start of a new industry with the Angora goat, my family has always played a role in the agriculture industry. For 130 years, the ranch has always been a place where my family can come back and work together and keep the heartbeat of the ranch alive. But the reality is that today, most ranch operations couldn't say the same. There's so many opportunities outside of rural America that's pulling my generation away, myself included. But although I was born into this ranching culture and heritage, I'm just far enough removed to not have actually lived it myself. I heard all these stories growing up and watched all the Westerns, and over the course of time, I had the image of the cowboy built up so much that it was practically a myth. I mean, these stories were incredible, but they were somebody else's, and I had no personal experience to pull from. And so I struggled with what was my imagination of the cowboy, and what was a legitimate figure in our history, and also in today's reality. I found myself in the city most days with these questions burning inside of me. What is the truth of the cowboy? Do these kind of stories still exist today? Do cowboys still exist? Was I born in the wrong generation and, and too late to find out? So after graduation, I felt called to find answers to these questions and to write my own story along the way.
In order to best search for the answers to my questions about cowboys, I want to know where I need to go, and also where the cowboy came from. My first stop is with highly acclaimed author and historian, Professor H.W. Brands at the University of Texas. Well, in the case of American history, it's to the Mexican roots of the cattle industry. So cattle spread from Mexico up north in the direction of the United States, eventually reaching Texas. And with the cattle came the Mexican vaqueros. And they eventually taught the Americans that they encountered in Texas how to deal with cattle. And it was really when the Mexican cattle culture and the Mexican cattle reached what would become the United States that the American cowboy was born. Once beef enters the American cuisine, then all of a sudden Americans uh, learn about the cowboys. So if somebody were looking for the cowboy today, you'd still go to Texas. I mean, Texas was the home of the cowboys, and there are still cowboys in Texas. I suppose you gotta go somewhere else in the United States. Montana would be a good place, Wyoming, uh, but someplace sort of in the northern plains where there's still lots of cowboys. But personally, I would like to see how cowboys do their job, do their work, how they're viewed in other countries in the Americas. Uh, Mexico would be an obvious one because uh, the Texas cowboy originated from the Mexican cowboy. And in South America, they have a big cattle industry in Argentina. So what do cowboys look like there? My time with Professor Brands gave me great insight of where I need to go. To begin the search for the cowboy, I decided to go where it all began, the genesis of the cowboy. We're going to Mexico and meeting my mother's cousin Charo at the border in Del Rio. This will be my first time to visit my family ranch in Mexico. Ranch, how you oh, doing, man? Oh, it's good to see you. Nice to see you. So, yeah, but is there anything else that we need right here in Del Rio? Beer? Be okay, you know y'all want Mexican beer, right? I want a modelo, un modelo, we'll get, some, we'll get you some Mexican beer. Excellent. Okay, all right. So we're right here on the Texas border. People live on both sides of the border here all think of ourselves as border people. We don't think of ourselves as being Americans or Mexicans, it's, we're just here on the border. This is uh, tumultuous times, you know, we're, we're neighbors. We've been neighbors for hundreds of years, so I think we'll be all right. We're in Coahuila right now, and Texas used to be Coahuila. Out here, it's just really different. The reason it's different is because it's not different. This stayed the way it always has been. Today's my first day with the Vaqueros. We start with breakfast, and then it's off to work. And I'll admit, I'm nervous if my cowboy heroes will accept me. Me llama mucho la atención en los animales desde chiquito. Quito yo todo el tiempo el campo.
Our big market for our, for our steers is the United States, so we ship all our steers there. It's still roping, it's branding, it's, you know, castrating, it's doing everything the old way. It's, we don't, we don't do it any other way. Somos un equipo aquí. En cada trabajo hay, hay equipos de trabajo, ¿no? My dad did all of this. That's where this all came from. This didn't come from me. I'm just currently the steward of it. Don't put off for tomorrow what you can do today. That was the way he lived his life. And that's why he got so much done. He was my brother. He was always so sincere and so honest, you know. I loved him. I, I looked up to him. I respected him. I think he knew more about the cattle business than anyone I ever met. We've been down there, oh my gosh, ever since uh, 1948, and we we're still down there in Mexico and, and having a lot of fun doing business with them. That night, one of the younger vaqueros invited me to his home to meet his family. It's a privilege and it's humbling to see the personal lives of the vaqueros on the ranch. I'm eager now to step back into their working lives. Each cowboy has several horses that he rides. They ride them for about two months, a month or two months, it depends. And then they'll switch them out, uh, release those horses and bring in a whole new Ramuda and then work those horses for a while. We want a working horse. 
but they're not just born working horses. They start off as potrillos, which are just wild colts. And it's a process to get them to where it's a working horse. And that process takes time and effort and a lot of work from our cowboys. Pero este parte de Chuchabajo, tomando y manzando los potrillos, es un gran parte? Sí, todo eso es parte de la manzana. Ya cuando entregan un caballo, tienen que ir bien herradito y todo. Sí. Ya de freno y todo, ya trabajando el caballo. Sí. Entonces es cuando ya está manto. Sí, hasta manto. ¿Y por cuántos años ustedes se pueden usar este caballo? 20 años. 20 años. Today, the vaqueros will be breaking in a few of their potrillos. First, we must search for them. Trabajando con potrillos es lo más peligroso. Es muy peligroso, sí. Porque, pues, ahí está la vida de uno ahí. on the ranch all with all the cattle is all on horseback so we have to have horses I'm not really sure which horse that we're gonna get today but uh, we may get one that's either never had a saddle on him and most likely that's the case and so we'll be getting someone on a horse for the first time These horses they've already brought in and work. Those are the large, the older horses. That's why when I say we start them at around two, we're not we're not riding them at that age. No, we just start getting them in to get them used to a halter and all. We're just taking these out, so we don't have too many horses in here right now before we start really working on on breaking a horse. Some of these boys are will be the first time they've ever been roped. We're going to get down to those in a minute. Soy vaquero. I comencé los nueve años. Los potrillos. Ajá, eso es lo más peligroso que puede haber. Sí. Aquí, andar lazando y, y arreando ganado y todo eso, manzando potrillos. Para mí es diversión. It's not one of these horse whisper deals that, you know, that you see on TV, like from India, where the guy gets on his back and, you know, rolls around on the ground with them. This is, this is the kind of done the old way. We're gentle with them, but they're still, it's, it's, it's breaking a horse. This is the first time this animal's ever been roped. Right on your feet. 
day. When the Vaqueros called me into the corrals, I not only saw this as an opportunity to work with them, but to prove myself. Victoria then began to show me the first step of how they break their wild horses. Then he handed me the rope and said, Probarlo, try it. you do that until he gets used to being in here and being on a halter, uh, that's stage one. Stage two is what they're doing now. Uh, there's some horses that take it really quickly and they're, they're very, they're very gentle, and some of them are not. Uh, so look over here at my finger on the right. Let's watch this a little longer. So that the horse, if he could actually rear up, because he's got his back leg lift up, he can't rear up right now. If he could rear up and all, he might rear over backwards, hurt himself, he could run, and this way he doesn't get hurt, he gets used to being touched. So that's why they keep hitting him with the saddle blanket, which of course doesn't hurt him at all, but it makes a noise. And he gets used to the sound and he gets so he's not he's not as scared anymore. So pretty soon they'll be able to put a saddle blanket on him and then after a while they'll be able to throw the saddle on him as well. Once the horse realizes that he can't move that well, then he won't buck. He won't take off running and he won't get hurt until he gets used to it. After once he gets used to all of this, because right now he feels kind of helpless because he can't get that back foot down. They get you'll notice right now they're starting to move his back foot some. They'll start dealing with his back foot here in a minute. And then they'll let his foot down. Yeah, you want to get in the middle of the set of the corral because he's gonna start running. Tomando, ahí sí es difícil, muy difícil. ¿Por qué? Porque tienes que mucho cuidado, tratar de domar al, al animal y, y saber domar, no, no cualquier doma en un caballo. Te cuidas tú y cuidas a los demás. the third time he's been ready.
once he's actually saddled and they're riding him, they'll come to a point very quickly where they'll actually take him out. He'll go out with the cowboys. Uh, they won't rope off of him for a while, but they'll start riding, going out on him daily, riding him daily. Then they'll let him go after a while and then bring him back in again. And it's a, it's a period over about six months he would go from when he was first roped to when they put a saddle on him. It's about six months after you start riding him, then they're actually roping off of him, and then he's pretty much a complete animal. You need a horse. Right. You have to have a horse. Too many draws, too many creeks, too many cliffs. It's, it, everything is done on the horse. Like this process, I mean, how, how, how far back does it go? Oh, it's just far, a hundred years. Yeah, I mean, several hundred years. Yeah, it's, it's just the way it's always been done, so to speak. There was something truly special in doing a job that had never changed. I felt the connection, not only with my heritage, but with the Vaqueros. Despite our differences, in the corrals we were equals. Returning home from Mexico, I have a newfound appreciation for where the legend began. It's no coincidence that the cowboy emerges in American national conscience after the Civil War. Up until the Civil War, there was this diverging sense of who we are. So the Southerners, we hold slaves and we're part of the slave society. Northerners were opposed to slavery and we're, you know, we have this different model. So what brings the country together after the Civil War? And again, it was no accident that the cowboy served very well because the Northerners and Southerners could, could meet on the Western Plains and they could be sort of seen for what they are. Instead of having to deal with that baggage left from the Civil War, you know, do you know how to deal with the cattle? Can you brave the climate? Can you do all that stuff? So in some ways, the, the cowboy was this myth, not so much of creation exactly, but as of a reunification myth. And so it pulls the country together at a time when the country most needs to be pulled together. Now that I know where the cowboy came from, I want to know where the cowboy's going. I really think there's something special about the nostalgia of, of cowboying and ranching. I mean, it, it's something that's a rich part of the American heritage. I don't want to ever really feel like we lose that. I just think that we have a purpose, we have an objective to not just kind of fall by the wayside. I mean, we've got so many tools at our fingertips to help us do it better. There will always be a place and a time for the cowboy. You need to have diversity. You have to be ready for change. And so we'll just continue to evolve, I believe, and continue to get better and better.
Hey, how are you, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Nice, nice to right. see you, nice, nice to see you. What I thought was gonna get an overview of who we are, what we're doing. You know, where we live down here, we're in Big Sandy here. Sure. Um, but if I zoom way out, this is the scope of the ranch here. Goes about 45 miles um, southeast. Okay. Um, there's more of a big view of it there as it goes across. My first morning on the IX Ranch, I noticed an immediate difference from Mexico. The faster pace, the machinery, and even the noises. Like up here, is that kind of more of a, a way of working cows? Maybe with like ATVs or with dirt bikes. I mean, is that kind of something you're seeing around here? Yes, and here's why. I grew up riding horses, but I also, I grew up riding four-wheelers and dirt bikes and those types of things, and we're constantly learning new and better ways to do things. It's like we were talking about the motorcycle. If someone were to see me out there on that, they'd be like, wow, that's not a cowboy. You know, that's the, and I'd be like, you know, you haven't flipped a few pages into the cover of the book yet. When it's 30 below and I gotta bring in some cattle, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna wear my cowboy boots and, and some shaps and a, and a cowboy hat and go freeze my butt off out there just so I look like a cowboy. I'm gonna look like an Eskimo out there and look probably like the silliest thing you've ever seen, barely getting around on a horse. I gotta get the cow. I mean, I have to take care of the situation. I don't always have to look it to be it. Everything that this ranch does and generates is from what it has here. So I have to focus on efficiencies. The fact is, is I have a big job to do out here and we have a lot of land to cover and a lot of things to do. And my time is valuable. But you gotta train a horse, you gotta feed a horse, you gotta shoe a horse. Right. Less and less of that being done. The motorcycle for me, it allows me to see a lot of things in a day that on a horseback or taking my pickup would have a huge impact on the land. I can cover so much with that bike and see what I need to see as the manager of this place and, and know what needs to be done. I can easily go find if there's missing cattle somewhere. It's, it's a part of my toolbox of things that I use to help me do my job better. So yes, I, I wouldn't say that it's like taking over because we're never gonna be where we don't work at. You'll see on Tuesday, we just, we will, the, the gators will be out there, we'll use those, but it'll be to drift stuff to where we are with horses. We're still doing the same thing. What we're doing with the resource hasn't changed so much. I think there's a disconnect anymore on urban America and rural America. To get that steak to their plate takes, you know, a lot of work all the way down the line. But we do, we have a disconnect between what's really going on and, and what they think's going on, so. I think cowboys still handle cattle to the best welfare they can for the animal. And then for the people they're raising the cattle for. Monday, that's getting another 300 some head into the pasture. So there's 900 in there. So on Tuesday, we can sort 900. Every year about this time, we get ready for sorting. So we start collecting these smaller groups into a large group so that we can sort the, the steer pairs and the heifer pairs and be ready to start shipping the steers at weeding time. I'm always thankful for being out here. Always kind of dreamed about going out west and being a cowboy out there, you know? I knew that if I didn't try it, then uh, I'd always be regretting it. 
so I didn't come out to change anything I came out to do what was already there you know it's not all just about the boots the shafts the horses it's about how you handle your cattle how you treat the cattle um, you know just how you care for them Back to the, to, well, so if you're, as you're looking straight ahead, look to your right back there, there's an age brace for the game. We're decided to become responsible for a living, breathing thing. And over, back right behind you. You have to just be capable, I think is what it comes down to, is you have to be able to do the job and it doesn't matter what you look like doing it. Well, I think that's really cool that your branch is kind of the meeting the two uh, styles in the middle. I'm hoping when you guys come away from it, you see that there's there are still cowboys, but that we're adapting, I guess. We have to take care of what we've got, and we're just using the tools that we've got before us to do that. We, we're using it all. If you can't see shoes on horses making sparks in the night, then you know you're not out there really enough. After we finished sorting, Richard went straight back to his office to put all the numbers into his books. It's the hardest part of the business to focus on. I think there's a change, there, there, and there has to be a change as it gets harder and harder to make money because it's still a business. You can't manage what you don't measure. 
by measuring what we're doing, we're able to make more proactive management decisions instead of being so dang reactive to everything. The cowboy will never go away. There'll always be a need for people to do the hard jobs that no one else is willing to do. Because of the, the passion that we have for what we do, we're always learning. There will always be a place and a time for the cowboy. Coming home from Montana, I learned that not all cowboys look the same. Only their purpose does. Gary in Montana is one of the few people in my generation that I've come across pursuing the cowboy lifestyle. It seems like most millennials desire to know where their food comes from, but few desire to actually be a part of the process. So what is it? What keeps young people coming back to a seemingly fading way of life? I'm excited to explore this idea further on my next stop. In reality, it, there are a lot of things that people can do to make a lot more money, but it is a passion that our family has, and it's something that through the generations, our family has worked to not only keep the ranch in the family, but also the family in the ranch. Growing up, every time I would leave for school, my dad would always say the same thing. He would always say, son, be a leader today. We don't want to create pressure for our boys. We want them to do what they feel called to do. Wildlife was kind of where he had focused his attention and felt like that was what he wanted to do. He wanted to play college sports and live that dream, and that was an awesome experience. After going to college and making a new group of friends and seeing that I really wasn't quite like those people. You know, we have such different backgrounds, but the background that I have, I would never take back. I remember two years ago, Tucker went with me to the Florida Cattlemen's Convention. Each of those five ranches in Florida that we visited, guess what the question was? Tucker, I guess you're headed back to the ranch. And at each of those stops, he stumbled with that question. He didn't really know where he was headed next or what he was gonna do. That night, he and I sat down for supper. And I said, Tuck, I want you to go and pursue your dreams and, and pursue your calling, wherever it is. Go where you feel called to go. And if that's at the ranch, the door is open. And then it just seemed like there was this huge weight lifted off of his shoulders. And I learned that the more I was away from home, the more that I just was drawn back and connected to the land that was here. I was tied back home. And I do believe that's where we find true joy, is when we live within our calling. From creation forward, there have always been people that have accepted the call to be caretakers of his creation. And so I see that as, as a continual, not as a, for a period of time, this is what man will do. Okay. So this is my brother. Lionel. Hey, what's yeah, up? Right okay, Lamb, yeah. Okay, cool. Good to meet you, man. I think that is a continual calling of what man is called to do.
process and kind of we're sorting a lot of different ways. So yesterday and today, two big days for us. Okay. We're weaning, we're sorting cows, one, two, three, four, five different ways, depending on which pasture they go to. Sure. So we're a lot of record keeping. Here, we're, we're different being a seed stock herd where we're raising breeding cattle. Right. Individual animal management is very important to us. Instead of this pasture being a unit and that pasture being a unit, every single animal is a unit. Okay. And so with that, we, we keep inventory of where every single animal goes. I mean, we've got spreadsheets this long showing every move that every cow Sir. has made on this ring. Right down here at the far two pens, we've got an individual feed efficiency testing center. Gotcha. I mean, as you look at our global society, we've got a lot more mouths to feed. There's not any more land. So the, only, the best way I know to feed these people is to be more efficient in producing the food with the given resources that we have. So on this side of town, a lot of my family lives here in really close proximity. My wife and I just bought this house and be moving into it here soon. And then just down the street is the house where my grandfather was raised and where he lives now. Going to eat and everything. You know what? At Warren oh. County, slept 12 you hours last oh. night. We don't know exactly where we've been. We've been south of town, past the South Brown Ranch, uh -huh. went west. Turn yeah. north, came out by. I think we've been 50 miles. Well, we've been. Dad, you have a hat or a cap? Okay. Anyway, y'all come on in. It started in about 1903. In the early times in the cattle industry, and a lot of it was just new and uh, different. Changes happened, but in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways it was the same. The cattle, the horses, the, the things that it, it made a lot of difference. And as it changed, we, uh, we changed with it. We'd do a lot of things horseback and then today you're you know, in a pickup, but uh, still love it and take care of it. We had a lot of fun, put a lot of a lot of hard work to it. We're just part of it and part of the family, and another generation's coming on, and it means a lot to us. Has it been fun watching Dad? And... It's it's a real neat deal to help one another and like I said it, it doesn't just happen. It's taken a few generations, hasn't it? Yeah. And more to come. And more to come. And so you know when people get tied to something that always brings you back to something you want to help, you want to be a part of that. You've been noticing like a generational you no know, gap. So there's yeah there's been a generation gap of of people that didn't necessarily come back, that were born here but didn't come back. And we've seen that in our school numbers dropping in the past three years. Now my generation and the millennials, I guess you'd say, are, are starting to come back and uh, be a part of the community, which has been fun to watch. Of my age group, I'm one of the first to come back, but we're trying to make it to where there's not another generational gap. Gotcha. You know, we wanna make it, we wanna make it better whatever way we can what a group of people have been doing for a short time now in Throckmorton is really trying to revive the school. Because if the, if the school falls, the town falls. We've seen it happen in a lot of rural communities. Yeah. Nelson, you've, throughout all of our conversations about Throckmorton School District, you've talked a lot about what are our expectations for our children? 
And I'd love to hear from the newest resident and homeowner of Throckmorton, Texas, of his expectations of why he moved back to Throckmorton, if he can do that in 30 seconds. <laughs> Took you more than 30 seconds to ask the question. <laughs> My expectation is a place to be tied to. Uh, whenever I graduated high school, I didn't have the intention on coming back. I've lived here my whole life, but this has been different because I'm moving in with a new wife. I can be a part of a lot, a lot of different things in the community that I couldn't whenever I was in school. I've definitely seen how everyone loves each other here. You know, if you don't move back, the town's not going to be here. I want to come back to the ranch, and I want the town to be here. We are coming in at a really good time and that, uh, you know, we needed Throckmorton and Throckmorton needed us. The impact the Browns had on Throckmorton was easy to see, just how they cared and loved for those around them. But their influence was not limited to only Throckmorton. In my last days there, they began preparations for a ranch rodeo coming up that their family had a large presence in. This will be the 37th annual Texas Ranch Roundup in Wichita Falls. And my dad gathered up three or four ranches. Wouldn't it be neat if we could find a way for our ranch cowboys to get back to what we do on a daily basis at the ranch? He had uh, kind of a vision of being di different than regular rodeos. Going to a ranch rodeo and seeing the more, kind of the, the way rodeo really started was what we've returned back to with ranch rodeo, where the men on our ranches can compete. And you do it with a team and you do it with guys that you're with and work with all the time. And so my dad helped start this, which is now, I mean, ranch rodeo is across the nation. and. People love it because it's their hometown team that they come to cheer for. So, team meeting here for Ranch Rodeo. Big weekend ahead, excited about it. We want to get all the plans made, what needs to be done here and there, and kind of coordinate that and uh, come up with a game plan. So, Lana, would you kick us off with prayer, please? Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the rain that's in our way. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to do what we love to do. Our Lord, please keep that protection over all the cowboys and livestock this weekend. Shine your light. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Everybody that's there, I'd love for you to go cheer on Tucker and Carly. Their talent competition's at one. Okay. Do you know what you're okay. going to do? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about it last night. We were like, we might want to speak or something. I'm going to see if Tim McGraw and Faith Hill do it. I would. Maybe Jason Alpine. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all want to win this thing? <laughs> we won this event in 1984, 1992, in 2006. I'd love to win this thing. It would be great. So every year a saddle is awarded to the top cowboy at the ranch rodeo. And in 1992, Donald Brown won it. And so Lana's been training to hopefully win it this year. This show, my goal is to go in there and be uh, slow and smooth and let him be correct, more laid back and ready to go. Lanham is very talented. I mean, he's great with a horse, he's great with a rope, he understands cattle. Now, he's a, a very talented 
cowboy. Uh, I think that this saddle will be a really big award for him that he's always wanted. I'm confident Lanham's going to win that saddle. Hello, Texas, Wichita Falls. How are you tonight on a Saturday night? Well, we thank you. This is the original, the granddaddy of them all, 37 consecutive years. Ranch Roundup, right here. I'm Charlie Throckmorton, Grandview, Texas, along with my partner in crime, James Orcasitas from Las Cruces, New Mexico. And the intention of the event was to bring the ranch cowboys off the ranch, bring them to town, and have good friendly competition in the events that, that mirror what we do on the ranch on a regular basis. You know, wild cow milk and every now and then you gotta catch a cow out in the pasture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, branding calves and doctoring one when he gets sick and being able to rope and do it in the pasture. You know, those are all real life situations. Pinning cattle out of, you know, taking them out of the herd and putting them into a pen. Brown. You know, bronc riding, we still break horses today and we need to ride one that can buck. The camaraderie has been amazing among the teams for 37 years since this event began. In those multi-day tournaments, you don't win it in the first day. Right. You can only lose it. They're in striking distance to do some good tonight. We're just, you know, it's fun. In all these places, it, just drive out in the country and you're going to find the same basic culture that you find in Throckmorton, Texas, is alive in South Saga City in Japan, is in Australia, and all the way to wherever you go, all you have to do is drive out in the country and find it. It's not very far away. And if people in the outside world could see that that's what's out here, maybe it restores some of that, your feeling about mankind. Still out there, there are those kind of people. <laughs> In my time with the Brown family, I have not only felt their love and seen how it impacts their community, but I also see them as a beacon of hope for the future of the cowboy. As Americans found themselves more and more living in cities and working for other people and being at the mercy of forces beyond their control, the idea that at one time there was this figure who was in control of his own destiny, this becomes even more powerful the farther it is from everyday reality. Nations sort of live on their myths, the, the stories they tell themselves about themselves. I feel myself closer to a better understanding of the cowboy. 
but Kelly's words ring in my ear as I return home. Is it true? No matter where I go, will I find the same culture, the same passion, the same spirit? Let's find out. gaucho tradicional eso, son las personas que eh, empleaban los estancieros en el principio del siglo XIX eh, para hacer cosas, para, para hacer tropa, para matar vacas. Y no había nadie para hacer eso, no había gente. Entonces esos gauchos que iban y venían a través de la pampa, uno los, los, los necesitaba mucho este, para que le hagan las cosas. El taxi driver me dijo, los gauchos son legendarios. ¿Por qué? Bueno, yo creo que una parte es por este gaucho Martín Fierro que te digo, ¿no? Que es, los chicos se suben a esa leyenda, ¿no? Del hombre errante que va de un lugar al otro, que a veces este, se pelea y queda muerto ahí con un cuchillo en la panza y si no, le, qué sé yo, no, ni siquiera tiene un centavo, ni un peso, ni nada. Tiene su caballo, su montura, su cuchillo y su mate, nada más, ¿no? Sí. We have heard the legend of the gaucho. Now it's time to go and see the real thing. We were invited to go to Miguel's Estancia in Patagonia, just outside of San Martin de los Andes. Me gusta ese trabajo. Y disfruto cada momento. Todos venimos del campo. Nuestros abuelos o bisabuelos o tatarabuelos. Seguro que alguno fue inmigrante y y alguien empezó como agricultor o ganadero. Creo que, que puede ser por ahí, por ese lado. De que uno busca ver eso, de cómo, cómo se vivía antes. Y en muchos aspectos, eh, muchas cosas las hacemos como se hacían antes. La verdad del gaucho y toda mi familia son del campo, así. Y mi abuelo, mi papá, todos se criaban en el campo y por eso yo sigo la misma. gaucho tradicional y ellos como filosofía no querían ser empleados, eran, eran muy orgullosos, ¿no? ellos te prestaban su tiempo, este, a veces ni te cobraban, este, no, no les interesaba nada. Es manejar un lazo, poner un cuchillo en la cintura, ponerse un paño al cuello, un sombrero o una boina. Una bota. En estos campos de, de Patagonia, más que un negocio, es una elección de vida. Es mi forma de vida.
Once we finished working cattle that morning, we stopped by a creek, unsaddled, watered our horses, and started a fire. And because of the coolness of the weather, they even packed lunch in their saddlebags. Hay muchas veces cuando ustedes no quieren hablar, es, es, es como silencio, es, es como un paz con la tierra. Yo, yo no sé cómo se dice, pero es, es, muy, es, muy, es muy lindo. No encontré en las otras estancias, es, es distinto de acá, yo creo que. Es que me parece que a veces disfrutamos ese silencio. O sea, si, si trabajamos acá en el campo es porque nos gusta la, la tranquilidad, la, esa es la soledad esta. Entonces, no necesitamos estar hablando todo el tiempo. Está lindo escuchar el silencio o el río. Es una linda historia, ¿no? Mi abuelo era un tipo muy aventurero. Le gustaba la aventura. Eh, mi bisabuelo, que era un bastante intelectual, eh, estaba aterrado por el eh, panorama de guerra que se estaba armando en esa época, en la primera, la primera década del siglo XX. ¿no? Entonces él dijo, mira, yo tengo 14 hijos, este, tengo unos cuantos, este, puedo eh, dedicar dos o tres hijos a hacer otra cosa para la familia por si esto acá en Europa se pone realmente muy feo, hay que irse. Entonces mi abuelo dijo yo quiero ir. Sí, sí. <risa> se fue para distintos lados, se fue a Córdoba, a Mendoza y finalmente se fue ahí a la provincia de Neuquén. Vino acá y empezó a recorrer todo y este, encontró ese lugar fantástico, que todavía sigue siendo fantástico, y lo compró. Hizo venir a tres hermanos más, o sea, que eran cuatro, cuatro hermanos de, de la familia, ¿no? Y hay hay una, una leyenda, ¿no? Ellos vivieron acá en el campo, ¿no? Fundaron esta estancia a principios del siglo. Entonces, este, mi, mi abuelo y sus cuatro hermanos este, más o menos organizaron la estancia, empieza la guerra del 14, con lo cual se confirmaba todo el miedo que había tenido mi bisabuelo este, que venía a la guerra. ¿no? Entonces, lo que hacen ellos, se trepan a un barco, los cuatro, y se vienen a pelear la guerra a Europa. Entonces, eh, cuatro de ellos hicieron la promesa de que iban a llevar una cruz arriba del cerro y cuando regresaban la, la iban a bajar. De los cuatro, dos mueren en la guerra. Eh, dos hermanos de mi abuelo. Entonces, dos de ellos no volvieron y quedaron esas cruces. Después, con el tiempo, fue quedando una sola porque el viento la rompió o el clima y luego eh, los patrones decidieron hacer otra simbólica de, de material, ¿no? de, de hierro, y pusieron los restos de madera adentro. Así que esa es un poco la, la leyenda de por qué la cruz está arriba del Cerro de los Pinos. Before I arrived in Argentina, I heard that Miguel had written a book about the forming of his ranch in Patagonia. 
So when I asked him about it, he was thrilled to show me. Ay. Este. Pioneer. ¿Y por qué querías uh, escribir eso? Y porque la historia es muy linda. Yo tenía muchas historias. Mira, acá había una cantidad de cosas que yo quería que no se pierdan. ¿Cómo se adaptó toda una familia este, a un lugar tan distinto? Porque estos vivían en un chateau este, en el centro de Francia, ¿no? Y de repente se encuentran en un lugar que no hay nada. Eh, todo lo que sabían hacer no servía para nada. Este, tuvieron que empezar a aprender todo, ¿no? Este es mi abuelo, ¿ves? ¿Cómo hiciste Sí, muchísimo. Yo diría muy amigo de él. ¿Ves? Mira, este soy yo y este es mi abuelo. ¿Y escribiste este para mostrar tu familia y para, para tener siempre? Yo creo que sobre todo para que no se pierda todo esto. Porque yo me daba cuenta que yo, ten, yo tengo la suerte de tener una buena memoria, ¿no? Entonces me acordaba de un montón de cosas que él me había contado cuando yo era chico. Porque él me enseñaba historia, me enseñaba todo un montón de cosas. ¿Cuál es tu memoria preferida con tu abuelo? Eh, bueno, mi abuelo eh, murió cuando yo tenía 20 años. O sea que lo viví bastante tiempo con él. Entonces hacíamos todo tipo de, de viajes y me enseñaba sobre cómo eh, relacionarme, por ejemplo, con la gente. ¿no? Era muy agradable de hablar con él, muy interesante. Eh, y había poca gente que tenía esas historias, ¿no? Sí. Entonces yo digo, si yo esto no lo escribo, de a poco esto se va a perder, se va a desaparecer, y, y es toda una parte de historia de la población de la Patagonia eh, que, que aparece en esta, en esta familia que viene ahí, se instala cuando no había nada, y empieza a hacer algo que hoy es muy conocido, pero en esa época era nada, ¿no? Bueno, acá está el, el libro para vos. ¿En serio? Sí, sí, sí. Para, yo, yo puedo regalar? Sí, te lo regalo. Muchísimas gracias. <risa> no. Muchísimas gracias. Uh, gracias, Miguel. Bueno, bueno, que lo pasen muy bien. Ya, sí. <risa> son, son historias este, divertidas, muy bueno, buenas. Es nuestro propósito para mostrar a la gente uh, tu historia. Y, uh, muchas gracias. Bueno, ok. Yeah. Well, as it turns out, Kelly was right. It doesn't matter where you go, but if you venture into the country, you will find people that share a commonality of servitude. From the animals in the pasture to the food on our plates. And if you take the time to get to know them, what's earned is a better understanding and appreciation for what they do for us, thanklessly, day in and day out. Returning home from Argentina, I bring Miguel's story home with me. And I'm reminded of just how powerful a story can be. Para ti, en tu opinión, ¿qué es el futuro del, del vaquero? ¿Qué es el futuro del vaquero? Pues es muchas cosas el futuro vaquero. Pues ahora, pues somos nosotros. Mañana, quién sabe. Ayer, ¿viste a los niños chiquitos? Bueno, esa es la historia del vaquero. When you tell this story, you automatically, I think, help ensure that there is a future. As much myth as it is history, myths are very powerful. Although the, the moment of the cowboy in history is brief, the moment of the cowboy in American memory goes on and on.
all established one place where we can all relate to and we can all come back to. One place where we all came from. Very important place. Returning home, it's an honor to share the stories of my journey. Stories of family, of courage, of change, and of unity. And I cannot put to rest the questions that once burned inside me. The truth of the cowboy is simple. It's our histories that make us different, but our future that brings us together toward a common purpose, feeding the world one plate at a time. And we all have a call to answer to. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you.